Now that we have begun our study of the book of Genesis and had a quick overview of it, I'd like to begin with the first two stories of the book of Genesis and really examine them very carefully. The first two stories of the book of Genesis offer us a vision of what it means to be a human being. And the technical terminology for this is anthropology. Anthropos means human being, and anthropology is the study of human beings. And so we gain our anthropology through looking at these creation stories, and especially the first creation story, to understand what it means to be human. As we do this, we have the opportunity then to think a little bit more about what deepens our study of scripture. And there are two other elements that we have to be careful of as we study scripture. One is that we have to allow scripture to be of a time and of a place that is different than our time and different than our place. We have values and perspectives in our contemporary world that are very good. That, um, that are important in terms of democracy and human rights and things of that nature. But at the same time, that has not been part of every culture and certainly has been not even a thought within most cultures before our times. So when we come to sacred scripture and come to these stories demanding that they make sense within our world and that they follow all the rules and laws and social customs of 21st century America, we make demands on scripture that are unfair. And this really ends up being a form of Orientalism. And Orientalism is basically a form of colonialism in which the colonial empires that took over Asia insisted that people dress and act and look like them, follow their religions, and didn't see the value of those cultures. We most would recognize the problems of that today, but it's also a problem in scripture. So we can't try to force scripture to have the same perspectives and views as we have today. As we look at these stories, a second thing that becomes very important is the impact of the study of archaeology or material culture on our understanding of the Bible. This has been going on for maybe about 150 to 200 years, 150 years where it's had a significant impact on the study of sacred scripture. So within the last 150 years we've discovered a number of languages such as Akkadian and Ugaritic that tell us other creation stories that are similar to those stories that we have in the Old Testament. And we see how there are other systems and religions that have um, similarities to what we find in the Old Testament. We have forms of leadership and government and politics that are also similar. We find poems, prayers, um, that are similar. So our view of material culture has a direct bearing on how we understand scripture. So let us now begin with a quick overview of the two stories that we find in the first three chapters of Genesis. From 1, 1, so chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4a, the first half of the fourth verse of the second chapter, <coughs> we have one story of the book of Genesis. We often credit the story to the P source. So this is the final um, redactor or editor of the book of Genesis, and we would think of the whole Pentateuch. And we hear about a, a very formulaic story about God within this. The thing that 
is probably most characteristic of this story is the emphasis on goodness. This word goodness comes, or good, tov in Hebrew, comes up seven times within the first chapter of Genesis. We hear about all the good things God is making. And ultimately, we slow down then to focus on that greatest thing God made, and that would be human beings made in the image and likeness of God. And so that first story then creates very strong patterns, very strong um, formulas for understanding creation and focuses on the goodness of creation. The second story is quite a different story. We would refer to it in the technical language of scholarship as being anthropomorphic. So once again, we have that anthropology root, anthropos, and then morphic meaning form. So this would be a story in which perhaps God is more in the form of a human being, and God does things a little more like human beings do them. And so within this story then, we see a much more perhaps engaging story with a little more drama and excitement and not as formulaic as our first story. In this story, we begin with God creating the man, or as what we say in there, Ha-Adam, so this would be um, a figure, the first figure, um, that really isn't quite gendered at this stage, um, creating Ha-Adam out of clay. And so therefore, we see God um, creating in a way that humans create, and God understood in a way perhaps that it's easier for humans to understand. So God starts then and he creates this man. And then God decides that this man needs to have a partner. And we have all kinds of things created and um, trying to find a suitable partner for ha Adam, the human being. And we have really mistake after mistake. So this is a very different view of God, and this would be this kind of J perspective, this Yahwistic perspective, as opposed to the priestly perspective in which there's an emphasis on order and a demonstration of God's kind of overarching perspective that can see things very clearly. In this second story, we see all these um, animals being created, all these things being created, and nothing quite right. So it takes God in this story a while to get it right. And ultimately, he does get it right. And we get the creation of Eve um, as the partner for Adam. Um, but even as you can see my kind of struggle here of how to refer to this person as Ha-Adam or Adam, really he doesn't become Adam until chapter 4 verse 26. He's always something a little bit different before then and, um, and so there's a struggle as we try to understand this and be truthful and cognizant to the language of the Hebrew which can be quite different than our various translations. Um, I have been reading during this course from the New American Bible translation and there are many other good translations, the New Jerusalem, the RSV, and the NRSV. And we'll see that they're all a little bit different in how they translate and try to remain loyal to the language, but still create something that um, we can hear and can be used in public liturgies. So we have this problem then of um, God who is a lot like us, God who works with clay, God who um, has many kind of starts and seemingly trials and errors, but ultimately kind of get th gets things right. So we have then two very different creation stories. Now, as we try to understand those stories and think about 
what those stories are addressing, we need to think a little bit about the other stories from the ancient Near East. And so when I speak of the ancient Near East, I'm speaking of a kind of about maybe a 500 or 1,000 mile territory. We can think of it as the Fertile Crescent. And we start, of course, with Mesopotamia. That means the area between the two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, and most of that area is part of contemporary Iraq. And within Mesopotamia, we find many of the firsts of civilization. And certainly in East, excuse me, certainly in Western Asia and Europe, the first writing takes place in Mesopotamia. And we see the first kind of great cultures emerge, and first in Sumer, in the south of Mesopotamia. We find Assyria in the north of Mesopotamia. In Babylon, in Babylonia, once again further to the south of Mesopotamia. And these cultures were the first kind of writers, especially Sumeria, and they left great stories behind them, which we see that the Bible was probably in dialogue with. And as Israel tried to understand who God was, Israel was, to me, seemingly trying to um, oppose God to some of the visions of the various gods we have in these stories. So a couple of the stories that I'd like to focus on a little bit would be Babylonian creation myths. Perhaps the most notable and important for us is this story of the Atrahasis. Now the Atrahasis is simply the first two words in kind of a Babylonian Akkadian um, that begin the story. We don't continue this tradition in the West, and, but this is also how we describe the books of the Bible. So, we, so a Jew does not refer to um, the first book of the Bible as Genesis, but rather as Bereshith, which can mean in the beginning traditionally, or perhaps better, when God began. Um, that would, so Bereshith is similar to Atrahasis, just the beginning words of the book, and that's how a book was known in the ancient Near East. So we've kind of spoken then about the ancient Near East and focused on Mesopotamia, but we can't forget that we have areas in Syria that led very left very important dynasties and archaeological remains. We can think of Mari in Syria. We can think of Ugarit, which left us a very important language, Ugaritic. And then we have all the various Canaanite peoples and Phoenicians and and the tribal peoples that were throughout Palestine and throughout, let's say, the Levant, which would be the coast of um, the Mediterranean that would touch contemporary Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. And we could even include, to a certain extent, Egypt as part of the ancient Near East. Even though it's on Africa, they were very much trading partners with these other countries of the ancient Near East. Turkey would be a similar thing. It was on Asia Minor, but very much within the orbit of Mesopotamia. So we find all of those places producing literature. But once again, I said perhaps the most important stories come from Babylon. This story, Atrahasis, is a story of competing gods and trying to kind of understand creation through the fights that these gods are having, and seeing a god like Marduk, a storm god, arise and try to control a female god like Tiamat. And we see within that an understanding of water, which the female god would represent, an understanding of nature, which this god Marduk represents. We see similar stories to that in um, northern Canaan, in Ugarit, between Mut, um, uh, one, between, excuse me, Yam, um, a god that represents the sea, and 
Baal, a god once again that represents parts of nature. So these then form a background and we see a competition between these gods and we see that human beings can be very kind of small parts of this picture and can often be simply the victims of these gods. In another Babylonian story called Atrahasis, we see that human beings were simply created as servants of gods, as ways to appease the gods, as one god becomes much more important than another god, and minor gods are unhappy, so they're given human beings. So this is an image of humanity that I would regard as much more negative and than what we find in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, I think, is pushing against that. And so, once again now, if we slow down to study this first story of the Old Testament in chapter 1, we see a much different picture. We see a very orderly picture, a picture that not only seems to be challenging this Babylonian perspective, and we must remember that Israel spent about 50 years in the Babylonian exile, around 587, maybe, maybe yeah, 587 to around 525, 524, so closer to 60 years in Babylon, where they were probably hearing these stories. And this is probably where the first chapter of Genesis was written, responding to these stories, but I think also to a certain extent responding to that second creation story in which God kind of works in fits and starts. So what we find then in the first story is a story of great order, a story focused on goodness. And this is a goodness that I raised at the end of our last lecture. We have to understand, and I think as Franciscans, this is very evident to us, that we do live in a world of brokenness and a world of difficulties, suffering and sinfulness. And we, can't, we always need to be cognizant of that. But at the same time, the Franciscan vision is an optimistic vision rooted in the divine artist and his creation, the world, us. And that vision, I think, is emphatically emphasized in our first creation story. So we see at the beginning that there was kind of a null and void. And this is once again where we must listen to scripture and realize that scripture has its own story and at times that's a story that's different than our Western philosophy. We really don't hear at the beginning of this story that there was creation from nothing. Rather, we hear that there was kind of a void. We hear that there was chaos we can see similarities in some of the Babylonian stories where there was just kind of a watery mass and God comes and works from that. And so we see God coming into that null and void. That Hebrew word here in verse 2 is tahum, which is related to Tiamat, that female goddess that we spoke about in the Atrahasis. And God creates and um, something out of that. God is able to kind of control of that and says, as we say in Latin, fiat lux, let there be light. And so we bring light into this in order to control chaos and over to overwhelm chaos. And these will be words that end up being very significant within the Christian tradition as we see that the opening of the Gospel of John is very much modeled on this same vision. So within the Gospel of John, we see light coming into the world and the world never being able to overwhelm that light. We hear that same vision here in Genesis. Let there be light. On the second day then, we see the creation of water and sky. And so we should remember that, yes, there was this kind of null and void and perhaps this was kind of a watery mess, but it would have been salt water, which is something that can never give life, that can never sustain life. Um, and so when we see the creation of the water in the sky, that would be fresh water, which people can water their fields with, which people can drink, which 
can keep people alive. So we see the creation of water and sky in the second day. And then on the third day, we see the creation of dry land and ultimately vegetation. So those three things then are, represent the first three days. They're all good things and God describes them as good. So we can think of a panel then, one, two, three. And then we have the creation of another panel, four, five, and six. And we have parallel things being created. And at the same time, we hear about this in a very Jewish perspective. So on the fourth day, we understand that the sun and the moon were created. But we don't hear that the sun and the moon were created because the names for them, Shemesh and Yarea, these are the names of Canaanite gods. And so we just hear about two great luminaries that are created. And this then kind of gives a greater sense to the light that was first created on day one. On day four, this is the sun and the moon. But the writer being very careful not to buy into let's say Canaanite mythology and, and really creating a Jewish perspective and view of this. On the fifth day, we hear about birds and fish being created. And so this then is something for the water and something for the sky that was created on the second day. And then on the sixth day for the dry land, we hear about um, animals being created and ultimately then we hear the capstone of God's creation and human beings being created. And the text really slows down here and emphasizes humans being created. And I'd like to just read verses 26 and 28 of chapter 1 of Genesis so that we hear just what's going on and how important it is. And verse 27 in the middle of it is pr probably a verse of poetry to just emphasize just how important everything, what's going on here is. So we hear, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 27. And finally, verse 28. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. So this is perhaps the most beautiful verse that we have in the Old Testament. This gives us the understanding of what it means to be a human, what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And we see here, very much opposed to the vision of the second story, that man and woman were made at the same time. Man and woman are both made in the image and likeness of God. And we find even some awkwardness in that language as first we hear being made in his image and then their image and all that type of thing. But the central point here and the source of our Franciscan optimism is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. That is something we can never forget. And that is something that we have to share with the world. We need to remember that as we confront the difficulties in our world, as we see the problems in humanity. So whatever human we're looking at, and whatever difficulties that person may find themselves in, whatever sources of trouble or sin are in their lives, all those people are made in the image and likeness of God. All those people have uh, have a set, have, can, can, can express something of God in their lives. This is the source of dignity. And it's a dignity that we never earn as human beings. As much as our culture may try to tell us that, 
as much as people try to convince us to buy things in order to increase our dignity, this is not something we can do. Dignity is a gift from God, and it's a gift that we must value, cherish, and spread that message that does not always seem to be heard in our world. So that then is the capstone of the sixth day. And after that then, we have the Sabbath, um, a day of rest, a day set aside you know, for worship of the Lord. And this is this very orderly, formulaic, and to me, extremely optimistic view of the creation of humanity. Now we must kind of counter that with our second um, image of how creation um, came to be. And so when we look at that second story in chapters 2 and 3, we see a number of you know, very positive things. We see God um, creating like, we're created, like we create things. So God's able to work with clay. God's able to work with humans. God has a concern for us. And so that's very important because as I've mentioned before, too often in these other stories, we see that God's only concern is that we, or the gods in the Mesopotamia, their only concern is that humans do things for them. Whereas God is very concerned about making us um, a suitable um, partner in this story. And this seems to be where all God's energy goes to. So when that suitable partner comes, there's a degree of happiness with that. And we see the goodness of that. But then we're kind of confronted with challenge. And certainly this is what we see whenever we encounter brokenness, sinfulness, and suffering. And this brokenness, sinfulness, and suffering breaks into this second story of creation. And this is then very much a folkloric story. And we have to be careful with this story that we don't read too much into it. So in a story that we're all familiar with right after this, that's part of this second creation story, we see that a snake comes up to Eve and a snake tries to um, get Eve to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a tree that God has created in the Garden of Eden and a tree which humans are not allowed to take from. This was the only prescription on them and probably as so many of us have experienced in our own lives, um, we can't always stay away from something that we should stay away from. And so this snake convinces Eve, after quite a long dialogue, to take from that. Well, we have to be cognizant of the folkloric nature of this story, of a snake that's talking. Later in the book of Numbers, we'll see and Balaam's ass, and that's another talking thing. They're giving us a lesson, but we have to be careful with it. We can't see this as the source of all evil. This snake is not the devil, it's not Satan. It's simply part of a story that's telling us about human weakness, about human brokenness. And so that snake then lures Eve into um, going to the garden and eating of a fruit. We don't know what the fruit is. And um, people say apple, but more than likely it wasn't an apple if, because apples don't grow too well in Mesopotamia where this story seems to be set as we hear about the rivers of the Euphrates and Tigris. And malum is the Latin word, which um, would be a pun on apple within, if you know Spanish, malum is close to malo, which means evil. So Eve eats from this and then quickly gets Adam to eat from this. Now at times people will use this as a way to condemn women, that they led us into sin. But as one of the great, the truly great Franciscan scripture scholars of the 20th century who continues doing work. Father Alexandra Delella once explained to me, and it took the snake many verses to convince Eve to bite from that fruit, and Adam was just half a verse. So we can never see this story as a way to condemn women or anything like that. 
This is simply a story of brokenness, of our difficulties. And as we grow in our appreciation for that story, and we see things that are very real about who we are, very real about our difficulties. And at the same time, we must always remember that the story involves a God who's trying to give us good things, who gave us relationship and gave us a suitable partner, who gave us a wonderful garden to be in, and that we pushed against that and we didn't know what was good for us. Ultimately, we're told if we eat from that fruit that we will die. And as we know, all humans die. But at the same time, we see an end to this story, which we'll see is similar to an end in many stories. There is a sense of mitigation here. People don't die immediately. And yes, they have to go off and work in the world. And we're told that that's going to be hard. You're going to survive by the sweat of your brow. And birth is going to involve pain. So those are difficult things. But at the same time, humanity goes into that world and Adam goes into that world with a partner, with Eve. And there's a sense of mitigation. God will make this still a good thing for them. They are kind of going to reflect then that ultimate message that we hear at the beginning of the story, that they are made in the image and likeness of God. This isn't necessarily Jay's perspective, but I think P gives us that overarching image, and we can see that many good things are still possible in spite of that sin, in spite of that difficulty that we find in chapter 3. So, as we conclude this second lecture, we're left with some very important questions for us. We must ask ourselves, what concept dominates the first chapter of the book of Genesis. What concept really then in turn dominates all of scripture as we're given a lens in the first chapter to read all of scripture through? We also must ask ourselves, what does creation have to do with science? And this helps us recall that we're hearing stories here, we're hearing about what it means to be a human but we're not having all our questions answered. And we can't expect all our questions to be answered from this story. And finally, we can think about the difference between the first and the second creation story and really think about what those differences are and what that causes us to reflect on and as we think about these creation stories. <laughs>